Paris for having me here. It's, um, I've never been to this city before, and I'm um, so grateful for the invite. This is from my book, Selected Amazon Reviews, Volume 2, yeah. edited by Jason Morris. And it begins, Priceless Heirloom. It's a review of a 14 karat ruby and diamond dynasty necklace. As an American boy growing up in France, I became mesmerized by an enchanting painting of an ancestor that hung never very far from the hearth. The painting, smudged by smoke and damaged by Vichy occupation of the chateau, showed a very thin and angular woman, her face like something reflected in the bowl of a spoon, festooned in bright stones that gleamed out still bright after the passage of many decades. Who is this woman? I used to wonder out loud until one evening, as my grandmother passed through the room looking for our vanished cat, Gato, <laughs> I noticed that she wore, she wore the same diamond and ruby necklace as the ancestor of the old damaged painting. I persuaded my grandmama to sit down and forget about her eternal cat hunt for a cat who had died long before I was born, when she was still a young woman, not even married to my grandpapa yet and to tell me about the necklace she wore. She took my little hands in hers, and in a low, breathy whisper told me how she had stumbled across these precious stones in a valise once. Amazon's 14K ruby and diamond dynasty necklace looks a lot like my family jewels. The resemblance is shocking enough to have made me drop my cocoa while leaping through the jewel pages this morning in an attempt to bring back Madeleine's style, the vanished days of yesteryear. These diamonds are perhaps a bit more brilliantly cut than the ones my grandmother used to sport. But as she mentioned, her diamonds predated modern mining methods, so they seemed rough, actually scratchy almost fungal in their savage brightness. You wouldn't want to wear them next to your skin, an aversion she averted by, she averted by normally wearing a sort of wool ascot as a liner between her necklace and her body. The clarity here is superb, like drinking water from the nearby fountain at Lourdes, where Our Lady <laughs> wriggled her shepherdess's staff into the rocky ground on which Bernadette fed her sheep. I used to ask my grandmother what would happen to her diamonds and rubies when she died, and she said she would never die. <laughs> <laughs> the rubies, in the Burmese style, have that distinctive pigeon blood, pigeon's blood shine that befits a country ironically racked by civil war. Rubies and diamonds. Blood and water, my dad used to say. He had one of those great Irish voices, like a poet. I think I'll order one of these necklaces one of these days, for if nothing else, like all the other dynasty jewelry I have ordered, worn and stored away in a vault, it will be fit for a king. If only I had a JPEG of my grandmama wearing this piece, darting after Gato, half consumed with anxiety, and yet noblesse oblige 
<laughs> always paramount in her gra fragile, gregarious mind, yet stopping for a minute to console a lonely and abandoned grandson who grew up without proper supervision in a country far from Long Island. <laughs> I think I've come to a point in my life where I deserve the priceless, priceless luxury of a dynasty heirloom. <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> this is uh, my book, Tony Green Era. This is my latest, uh, my second latest book of poetry. I have a new one that's just come out tonight. <laughs> but I'm going back to this one because it's, it's, it's recent, from the spring. And the first poem in it is called The Birth of Palash. Now, some of you will know what palash means, and others, like myself, don't actually, but it was a commission from an American magazine, and the editors were thinking of the word palash, as I understand it, was an invention of a romant German romantic poet. What was his name? Holderlin? Holderlin. <laughs> right? And he was put in the insane asylum in his last years, and, but in, in later years, he became happy again because he had thought of the solution to all his mental and emotional and world problems was palash. <laughs> and I'm like, what is it? And he, they said it was the, he, he, some visitors asked him, and he said, it's the, it's, it's the ability to say yes and no at the same time. Okay. <laughs> so once you have this in your head, everything is saying that to you. <laughs> And this is my notes. Saw R.H. Quaitman speak last night. A luminous slide keynoted the screen. Behind a tall podium she stood, her gaze wrapped in quizzical. The screen a bonanza of pink dots and yellow coronals buzzing like bumblebees. But they do not move. They only seem to move. Jack Spicer wrote, when the taxi does not move, it does not move. <laughs> op art, this is what Rebecca was talking about in this lecture of the op art that she loved. Op art, she said, like humor or, or sex, presses our no yes and no buttons simultaneously. What a gift to somebody who's struggling to write a poem about yes and no simultaneously. In the ancient ray known to the ancestors as Sun Ra, he came to Berkeley and he taught in my classroom. Sound, he said, is a form of travel. They wake you up with sounds instead of buckets of water because it's more economical. <laughs> it has that polish feeling in Berkeley, he said. It has that perhaps and mishaps feeling of, yes, I'm wearing it. And no, I don't remember what I'm wearing. <laughs> I'm not owning it, as I might have in the 70s. In 1971, in the fall, Sun Ra came and stayed. We read ancient texts and burned a taxi cab. We had that Mishka bear carved into the hair on our groins, the little bear of the Berkeley people. I don't know if you've been to Berkeley, California, but they have like a bear is their ancestral totem. Into the lounge stumbled the boy with the bear dangling from one arm. I'm Christopher Robin. It's perfectly true, and I have the polish feeling for you. <laughs> my bear is my amulet. My hand is the spring. I injured my hand on the rock for you. What? blood sprung from my wrist like a spray jet. It was quite real. It felt like it was burning. Wait, I cried in the, to the retreating ship. Don't leave me behind in Croatoan. I'm the guy who built that sign. You didn't even know how to spell it. About words, 
you had only the vaguest concept. They are falling into a thicket, wet leaves on the face of a book open to the sky. Why has birth been deified through the time-lapse option on your flip? You can watch a baby born, expelled, flying through the air and aging again till he or she dies, thrown into a grave. So you could do that all in one uh, continuous filming of somebody's life. If it is a po poetic movement, then it is some baby. The sort you wish would stay in their high chair, but no, here they come, tall and menacing, their baby clothes ripping apart with each step as a baby hand rises patiently to tear off its constrictive bib. And I had the idea that the bib, because it was a palindrome, you know the palindrome? was something that the palash movement would be against. <laughs> Not for baby palash, the palindrome of bib. No palindromes, in fact, for they distort life, give a false picture, an image rotten as old teeth in a barrel. Those sneaky, hypocritical sons of bitches, the palindromes, <laughs> with their fair and balanced look at what? At the word which reads the same backwards and forwards. Tear off the bib, pip, spit up the pap, pop, <laughs> shut down the radar, fuck pop and mom. This movement has its own volition. Abandon old kayak, <laughs> old race car, old level at noon, Eva, can I stab bats in a cave? <laughs> no, Mel Gibson's, it, it, Mel Gibson is a casino's big lemon. So yeah, you could just, <laughs> these, these poems write themselves, believe me. <laughs> About words you had only the vaguest concept. They are falling into a thicket, wet leaves on the face of a book open to the sky. That's just me returning to my own poem that I'm writing. I was like, what was I talking about? <laughs> yes, that was me. And so maybe I wrote it when I was a caveman, like a little cave boy in the primitive era. Yeah, that was me huddling in Luddite formation in a cave, bare hips squatting on my heels, building a fire out of human sinews, wondering about, is there life outside this cave? It's great tall creatures, sometimes so graceful, sometimes flashing murder, tiny eyes. Around my waist, a string made of vines. From the vines, a pair of clips. These hold my cock and balls on me. I'm pre-righted identity, from a fumbling savage to a, well, I'll call myself man, prehistoric man, and I'll have these genitals to show it. Now attention is focused on the string, and nothing will be allowed to fuck with it. These marks, I'll leave a million years, and one day, Werner Herzog will stumble on my leavings and will make a film of the birth of the Palache in 3D. <laughs> in luminous French Lascaux, where I lay scalded, beat, my flesh flattened by air flies, my teeth in a grimace, but my drawing still luminous, still a prevision. The rusty clips lie nearby, scattered in cave salt as once. In the 80s, Chris asked me and Doty, for a young, for a young poet, what is the easiest way to get into sulfur? It was like a poetry magazine of the period. <laughs> we, we all were wanted to get in it. And she said, write about the menstrual cycle. <laughs> and he did. And he sent it in, and the editor snapped it up. <laughs> How many of you can say their first publication was in sulfur? I had to submit again and again. 
It was like stuffing oysters into a parking meter. Again <laughs> and again with those 25 cent stamps. But for Chris, instant fame. Oh, golden boy of the dark red blood cave. <laughs> this goes on, so but I'm, I'm going to leave it with that. But yeah, that happens. That was like a little new narrative story just tucked into the poem. <laughs> to that in a little bit. But I did want to read a poem by Jack Spicer. And this is one that Peter Gizzi and I left out of our edition of Spicer's Collected Poems. And um, happily, it will appear in a forthcoming volume of, of, of the Spicer's Uncollected Poems that Daniel Katz, where is he? There he is, is editing for Wesleyan. Um, Thanks for leaving this one for me. <laughs> Peter and I left it out of our book because it would, because it, in, in this poem, Spicer pokes like a very mordant and brutally mean fun at two of his colleagues, young poets, who had each killed themselves. And he just goes to town and like, they're like they're too weak to have lived. And one of them was engaged when he died in 1951 to a young woman who was still alive when we were thinking of publishing our book. And we said, no, let's just wait, you know. And now she's passed on. And her son said, yes, you know, thanks for waiting, but feel free to print this poem now. It's called Good Night. Good night. I want to kill myself. Good night. I want to kill myself. Good night. I wrote a beautiful poem, but good night. Barton Barber jumped out of a 20-story window while his father was buying cigars, but good night. Donald Bliss drank a bottle of brandy, and then a little bottle of cyanide outside the Greek theater, but good night. I have seen enough of you, good night. I have seen that anyone can write a poem. Hart Crane died so that faggots could write poetry, and faggots have written poetry. Olson says that he wrote nominative poetry, Forget it, I said. Good night. This is the last trick I have discovered how easy it is to write poetry and how little it counts, how few sighs at the best are at the end of a poem. But good night. I have learned how little poetry has to do with anything. Good night. They knocked on my door tonight and gave me cigarettes. Poetry is gone. Anybody can have his door knocked on and be given cigarettes. Anyone can be given a poem. Ooh, let me tell you about Barton Barber. Took a Pepsi Cola bottle up his ass. I was in the next room. Wrote a poem I tried to quote tonight but you two are fucking in the next room. Good night, I don't want to be big uncle. Let me tell you about Barton Barber. I don't remember Barton Barber. I don't remember his poem, Good Night. I am not big uncle. Good night. Anybody can write a poem. You can do anything with a poem, with a poem. Fuck it. Anybody, even Donald Bliss and Barton Barber can write a poem. Good night. I want to kill myself. Good night. I want to kill myself. Thanks.
Irish, then bring some American cheer to you. <laughs> <laughs> now for my my new book. It's called. I'll tell you, I had this old book that came out in the spring, and I started writing a series of poems, like a serial poem, like Spicer would write. And the, the constraint was that it had to be about an element on the periodic table. Easy if you're a scientist. <laughs> but if you're not, you know. And I had this kind of, the other constraint was that I wouldn't look up to see what was an element and what wasn't. So my book here, it starts with hydrogen, tin, and then there was emerald. That was my crop. I came a cropper, and the third thing that I tried, it turned out it was not an element. So I kept writing these poems, and now um, uh, my hosts have made a little book out of them in English and in French. So let's plunge into this. I've had three brilliant translators, and each one of them will read the translation that they made of one of these poems in this book. And um, the, just having a prompt like, oh, it has to be about an element. I said, these poems are going to be so boring. But for me, they work the opposite way. I just think they, they were like the key to unlocking all my problems, my psycho psychic problems that I've been repressing all these years. <laughs> Don't ask me why. Oh, I guess because they were so elemental. Somebody told me that, you know, it's like, they all think <laughs> um, I'll read, I'll start with this one, Titanium. This was the poem that I wrote in, in the U.S. We had a, a, a bar shoot, shoot at me down in Orlando and Florida in a nightclub called Pulse. And like a madman came in and, and killed as many of the uh, men and women who were there. It was a gay nightclub. And um, they had the, many people lived. And some reported that the song that was playing when the gun, sh the gun started to fire was Titanium and by David Guerra and Sia, and this got into my head. This was the tr track that was playing when the shots began at Pulse in Orlando, the night 49 queers died, Titanium by David Guetta, the ultra serious David Guetta from France with Sia from Adelaide, and her words so apropos, or more than she might have thought in 2011 when she wrote these lyrics, those lyrics as a metaphor for loving a sociopath, I thought. Someone bulletproof, someone made of titanium. The takeaway for Sia and Guetta is that, you know, the chorus is like, you can shoot me, but I will never die. Um, the, the takeaway is that you can shoot us, but we will never fall. In the club, the dancers heard the shots but some assumed they were part of the mix at Pulse. Sound effects for titanium. There was so much love you could not imagine and hate. The ground was quaking. People waiting outside for their friends or dates or Uber cars. Sia <coughs> broke down in Denver singing titanium, which she dedicated to the 49 slain and the 53 injured in Orlando. You can hear it in her voice. Maybe a fear or guilt. Had she written something dumb that came into being? Had she told the world her little secret? And the world, being what it is, had turned on her to prove her wrong. Sticks and stones may break my bones. I may and talking loud, but ain't saying much. Like, did you, any of you know the video for Titanium? Uh, a little boy, and he's like 10. He's the little boy who was in, starred in Super 8. 
wakes out of a spell, he's on the floor, he's like, wakes up and he's in, it turns out he's killed every one of his classmates, uh, all the other kids in school, and you see the teachers whispering to the cops, like, what are we gonna do about this problem, boy? And he starts running. And our sympathies in the video are totally with this little boy, because he didn't even know what his superpower was. Ricochet, you take your aim, I'll wait for you. A titanium, through this thin ozone layer that drifts over Orlando, stars beam of liquid violet-esque light, like Prince, as if Prince had been slain. I thought I saw him gasping and gaping, one hand pressed across Morris Day's mouth, as though to silence him, not because he didn't appreciate Morris Day's droll chatter, but that the killer might hear poor Morris babbling, as though wedged atop the toilet tank as they were. He wanted no sound to issue from under the gray partition, and so wounded in a pool of purple rain and piss, they both of them died, but saved one man. That nice young preacher brother Taylor dropped by today. Said he'd be pleased to have dinner on Sunday. Oh, by the way, where did I put my plates of titanium? Shaped like surfboards or long cigars? Oh, by the way, he said he saw a boy who looked a lot like you up on Choctaw Ridge. He said my plates of titanium floated on the muddy waters. There was so much love you could not imagine hate. The skies were ripped open. The clouds eating themselves like the sharks of heaven. And he and Billy Joe were dropping something off the Tallahatchie Bridge. And here we have Hansan Boca. Pour introduire ce, ce texte, Kevin euh, disait qu'il euh, y, y avait eu ce, ce meurtre euh, dans une boîte, le Pulse, à Orlando, et donc il a écrit ce, ce texte après cela, et quelqu'un avait dit que, que la, la chanson qu'il jouait au moment euh, de, cette, euh, de cette tuerie, c'était Titanium, donc euh, de David Guetta. L'élément, malheureusement, c'est Titane, en français. Titane. C'était la chanson qui passait quand les tirs ont débuté au Pulse, à Orlando, cette nuit où 49 PD sont morts. Titanium, de David Guetta, le super sérieux David Guetta, de France, et Sia d'Adélaïde. Et ces mots si à propos, enfin, plus qu'elle n'aurait pu le penser en 2011, quand elle écrivit ces paroles. Une métaphore de l'amour pour un sociopathe, me suis-je dit, un type blindé, fait de titane, L'idée force pour Sia et Guetta, c'est qu'on peut toujours nous tirer dessus, nous ne tomberons jamais. Dans la boîte de nuit, les danseurs ont entendu les tirs. Ils ont pensé que ça faisait partie du mix joué au Pulse, des effets sonores de titanium. Il y avait tant d'amour que la haine était impensable. Le sol tremblait. À l'extérieur, les gens attendaient des amis ou leurs rencarts ou leurs voitures Uber. Sia fondit en larmes à Denver en chantant Titanium qu'elle dédia aux 49 personnes tuées et aux 53 blessés d'Orlando. Ça s'entendait à sa voix, peut-être la peur ou la culpabilité. Avait-elle écrit quelque chose d'idiot qui était devenu réalité Avait-elle raconté son petit secret au monde et le monde étant ce qu'il est, s'en était-il pris à elle pour lui donner tort Cross et cailloux peuvent me rompre le cou, je, frappe fort, je parle fort, mais j'en dis pas beaucoup. Genre, vous avez vu le clip de Titanium, un garçon, genre 10 ans, le garçon qui joue dans Super 8, se réveille d'un char, mais il a tué tous les enfants de son école, ses camarades, et on voit les profs murmurer aux flics, ils vont attraper ce gamin et il court. 
Notre sympathie tout entière va à ce garçon parce qu'il ne connaît même pas l'étendue de son super pouvoir. Ricochet, tu me mets en joue. Je t'attendrai au titanium. À travers la couche fine d'ozone qui flotte sur Orlando, les étoiles répandent une lumière liquide violetesque comme Prince, comme si Prince avait été massacré. J'ai pensé l'avoir vu haleter bouche bée, une main écrasant la bouche de Morris Day, comme pour le faire taire. Non parce qu'il n'appréciait pas ses plaisanteries, mais parce que le tueur aurait pu entendre ce pauvre Morris jacassé, comme si... Alors qu'ils étaient coincés sur le réservoir des WC, ils ne voulaient pas que le moindre son franchisse cette cloison grise et alors, blessés, dans une mare de pluie violette et de pisse, ils sont morts tous les deux, mais ont sauvé un homme. Ce jeune pasteur sympathique, frère, frère Trey Taylor, est passé. Il a dit que ça lui ferait plaisir de venir dimanche haut oh, et d'ailleurs. Où avais-je donc mis mes assiettes en titane en forme de planches de surf ou de longs cigares Oh, et d'ailleurs. Il a dit qu'il avait vu un garçon qui te ressemblait beaucoup sur euh, Charter Bridge. Il a dit que mes assiettes en titane flottaient sur les eaux boueuses. Il y avait tant d'amour que la haine était impensable. Les cieux se déchirèrent, les nuages s'entredévorèrent comme les requins du ciel. Et Billy Joe et... Lui jetait quelque chose du pont de Tallahatchie. Thank you. It sounds so brilliant in French. Now I wrote a poem called Oxygen. This one I thought was definitely an element, and it was. Um, I thought of an American film, and they called it Gravity, when these people are lost out in space. It's just her, Sandra Bullock. <laughs> But as the poem went on, it, cha it changed and it became about uh, what would happen if there was no letter O. I thought of that thing by Perec, that novel. What was it called in French? La disparition. Yeah, and we call it a void in the U.S. And anyhow, that's mixed up in this poem to oxygen. Sandra Bullock floating, <coughs> and her colleague, George Clooney, taps her glass, a panic that can still confound her. She had a little daughter, died of too much cough syrup in her. Oxygen. It is the element we throb into life in the union of sperm and egg. That day, I, I started to breathe through the womb, a gasp, blinking through the trailways like a C-section. I didn't realize this, but that's how oxygen is created, through the unification of the sperm and egg in conception. <coughs> tap, tap. Are you ready for the gaps in the world? Are you ready to make water for light, for the twilight? If you slump when, when it hits your chest, a tower deep will unsheathe you and shadow you. Was that only a bird with its wings a flap? Oxygen stands for O. Oh for order, for Oprah. Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> She named a whole crummy network after the element, oxygen network. Stands for O, stands for orgasm. The little face you wear, that little pout with the tongue tip wet like the back of a stencil. I could never write a poem, let alone a book like Perec did with his avoid. But if instead of the E, like he said, I, could, I couldn't write a book without the letter O. <coughs> Dodi, for then I couldn't put you in it, or my drone in it, or Mexico, <laughs> or oxygen. I'd be nowhere. 
and I couldn't even say where I was. For me, it would find its life in the elements. Riddles, not jokes. Fishes, not loaves. Inside, not out. Sentences, not words. Pastures, no woods. Blue, not yellow. Midnight, not noon. And I'll bring on my translator for this one, uh, Olivier Brossard. <laughs> Kevin disait que pour le coup, il, il soupçonnait qu'en écrivant un poème intitulé « Oxygène », il tomberait forcément sur l'élément. Euh, et euh, par ailleurs, une partie de, du poème euh, a trait euh, à, la, à la disparition de Perec, et, euh, donc, qui est « void en anglais. Et euh, Kevin s'est posé la question de savoir ce qui se passerait s'il essayait d'écrire un livre sans le, la lettre « O ».« Oxygène ». Ah oui, donc il y a aussi une des références qui est le film Gravity avec euh, Sandra euh, Bullock et euh, George Clooney. Oxygène. Sandra Bullock flotte dans l'espace et son collègue, George Clooney, vient toquer à son hublot. La panique peut encore la gagner. Sa fillette, morte de trop de sirop contre la toux dans son oxygène. Voici l'élément que nous faisons vibrer en venant au monde dans l'union du sperme et de l'œuf. Ce jour-là, j'ai commencé à respirer à travers l'utérus. Une trace étincelle et se ferait un jour comme une césarienne. Toc, toc. Oh, et tu es prêt pour ce monde grand écart Prêt à fabriquer de l'eau pour la lumière, pour le crépuscule Si tu t'effondres quand ça te frappe la poitrine, une haute tour te dégainera. D'ombre t'enveloppera. N'était-ce qu'un oiseau Ce battement d'aile L'oxygène, c'est la lettre O, c'est l'ordre, c'est Oprah qui a baptisé une pauvre chaîne de télé du nom de l'élément. C'est aussi l'orgasme, ce petit visage que tu mets, cette petite moue, le bout de la langue mouillée comme le, comme le dos d'un stencil. Je ne pourrais jamais écrire un poème, encore moins un livre, comme Perec a écrit La Disparition. Si je devais désavouer le O, je ne pourrais y écrire ton nom, Dodi ou mon drone, ou Mexico, ou l'oxygène. Je ne serai nulle part, incapable même de dire où je suis. Pour moi, cela prendrait vie dans les éléments, les énigmes, non les drôleries, les pins, pas les poissons, dedans, pas dehors, des phrases et non des mots, des prés, pas des forêts, bleu, pas orange, minuit, et non midi sonné. I guess it was just the luck of the drawer that you became my translator for this poem, because it could have been like more in my poem about Abigail or Vazan, but not Olivier. <laughs> See these, these let, letters of the alphabet follow me around. I'll read uh, one more from, well, maybe I'll read two more from my book, uh, Le, Les Elements. And this one is lead. Yeah, like simple lead. In, in, here in France, we call it plum. Latin word plumbum translates to liquid silver. So hello, plumbum. <laughs> P PB, as they call you on the table, the periodic table. We book people think of PB as paperback <laughs> when deciding whether to spring for a hardcover book or should I go for the PB. <laughs> And we who have kids think of PB as peanut butter for it's always time to put some P, B, and J on the table. 
not the periodic table. <laughs> lead? I don't know. One morning I woke and opened the door on my landing. In the distance, two towers and the moon rising, the supermoon, the biggest since 1948, and bells rang of lead. Elderly magazine sang of lead. I emptied the whole shebang of lead, rung down like a metal door by the Trump campaign, the surprising election of Trump as in the middle of the 60s, my dad stood by silently on the outside of the track while I ran the 100 yard dash. I didn't come in last exactly. But my little short legs never get me anywhere. Dad wouldn't embarrass me in public, but on the way home in the VW, he said, they call it a dash for a reason. <laughs> I sulked, staring out the side window at a heap of Long Island trees and branches and flowers and squirrels, driveways, gravestones, lawns, and woods ever-changing, like frames of film in a Super 8. And he says, come on, Kev, get the lead out of your ass just one time. When did he die? I don't even remember, but he was better off, for I made him angry with my ways. I was so aimless. I would never be an engineer. I didn't even know the word, but it was flanur. Above us, the supermoon beat down, bigger than any moon since 1948. And that was when he was alive, but I was not yet born. They were the changes in the world. An hour of gold mutating to an hour of lead, like alchemy, but in reverse how you play with the devil's bargain. I was the chicken who failed to cross the road, just stood there, dumb and feckless, the lead in my ass, virulent, aesthetic, a throb, a stance, total Bartleby, a reactor. About a year later, I was hitching back to Smithtown when a Volkswagen bug slowed down the window dropped. A pair of sunglasses looked out at me. Came to a halt. Oh, this turned out to be Justin uh, from Switzerland, who became my first Swiss boyfriend. <laughs> Slowly in the car, he told me that in Switzerland, they didn't grow boys like me. I was this American family, genius and species a superb example, like a butterfly. <laughs> Next to the old graveyard on Landing Avenue, I blushed in hot twilight. I was shy, but not very. It wasn't even half an hour when he asked me what my ass looked like. Seems so strange we were in a VW bug. <laughs> yes, the same model my dad drove. I shucked off my pants, dragged my underwear down to my knees and sat on Justin's Swiss hand, like a Swiss watch baby. Afterwards, a confidant told me it was unlikely Justin was really Swiss, as it is a name totally unknown in the land of the Alps and the skis and the liars, no matter. He was taller than I am and twice my age, and I was totally his American butterfly boy in the 10th grade, and my ass, he swore, was the most beautiful he had ever seen, even in Europe. <laughs> Here comes the distortion of Kronos as payback descends, and the cruel among us rise from their slime and take their places on the ceiling to slop down on our faces. Here comes the night. 
a blindfold tied round our heads and knotted behind the ears. Turn over the card. It's the hanged man. It's Villon. My name is Francois, which is ludicrous. <laughs> Born in Paris near Pontoise. And from this six foot length of rope, my neck will find out how much my ass weighs. <laughs> oh, and now for my translator. Yes. Oh, Abigail, please step up. Abigail and I. <laughs> Le latin, plein bum, c'est aussi la tâche dans l'œil. Alors salut, cul de plomb, PV comme il t'appelle dans la table, la table périodique. Nous autres gens du livre comprenons PV comme paperback, quand il nous faut choisir entre craquer pour la version reliée ou se contenter du paperback broché. Et nous qui avons des enfants pensons peanut butter, le beurre de cacahuète, puisqu'il est toujours l'heure de mettre le PB et la jelly sur la table, pas la table périodique. Mais pour le plomb, je ne sais pas trop. Un matin, je me suis réveillée, j'ai ouvert la porte sur le palier, et au loin, deux tours et la lune qui se lève, la super lune, la plus grande depuis 1948. Et les cloches sonnaient le plomb. Le magazine Elderly chantait le plomb. J'ai vidé le plomb et tout le tremblement, abattu comme un rideau de fer par la campagne de Trump, l'élection surprise de Trump. Comme, au milieu des années 60, quand mon père se tenait en silence au bord de la piste, tandis que je courais le sprint sur 100 mètres. Je ne suis pas exactement arrivée dernier, mais mes petites jambes courtes ne m'ont jamais menée nulle part. Ils ne voulaient pas m'embarrasser en public, mais tandis que nous rentrions à la maison, dans la, dans la Volkswagen, il a dit « Ce n'est pas pour rien que ça s'appelle un sprint. » J'ai boudé, le regard perdu dans les amoncellements d'arbres de Long Island, les branches et les fleurs, les écureuils, les voies de garage, les pierres tombales, les pelouses et les bois, en mouvement constant, comme les photogrammes d'un Super 8. Il a ajouté « Allez, Kev, bouge ton cul de plomb au moins une fois dans ta vie. » Quand est-il mort Je n'ai pas réussi à m'en souvenir, mais c'était mieux ainsi. Mes manières l'irritaient. J'étais tellement désœuvré, je ne serais jamais ingénieur. Je ne connaissais même pas le mot à l'époque, mais c'était « flâneur ». Au-dessus de nous, la superlune cognait, plus grosse qu'aucune lune depuis 1948, à l'époque où il était encore vivant et moi, pas encore né. C'était les changements dans le monde, une heure d'or qui se mue en une heure de plomb, comme une alchimie inversée lorsqu'on marchande avec le diable. J'étais le poulet qui n'arrivait pas à traverser la route, restait là, idiot et bon à rien, le plomb dans mon cul intraitable, esthétique une pulsation, une posture, Bartleby total, un réacteur. Un an plus tard environ, je faisais du stop pour rentrer à Smithtown quand une Volkswagen au coccinelle a ralenti. La fenêtre s'est abaissée, une paire de lunettes de soleil s'est tournée vers moi, puis immobilisée. C'était Justin, tout droit venu de Suisse, qui est devenu mon premier amoureux helvète. Lentement, dans la voiture, il m'a dit qu'en Suisse, il ne poussait pas de garçons comme moi. J'appartenais à cette famille, ce genre, cette espèce américaine, spécimen superbe comme un papillon. À côté du vieux cimetière sur Landing Avenue, j'ai rougi dans le crépuscule brûlant. J'étais timide, mais pas très. Il n'a pas fallu une demi-heure pour qu'il me demande comment était mon cul. C'était étrange de se retrouver dans une coccinelle Volkswagen, celle-là même que conduisait mon père. Je me suis débarrassée de mon pantalon, j'ai baissé mon slip jusqu'au genou, et je me suis assise sur la main suisse de Justin. « Comme une montre suisse, chérie. » Plus tard, un confident m'a dit qu'il y avait peu de chances que Justin, que Justin ait vraiment été suisse, ce prénom étant totalement inconnu au pays des Alpes et des skis et des menteurs. Peu importe, s'il était plus grand que moi, avait deux fois mon âge, et j'étais carrément son garçon papillon américain, en classe de seconde, et mon cul, a-t-il juré, était le plus beau qu'il avait jamais vu, même en Europe. Ici vient la distorsion de Chronos tandis que tombe la vengeance, et les plus cruels d'entre nous sortent de leur fange et prennent place au plafond pour dégouliner sur nos visages. Ici vient la nuit, un bandeau devant nos yeux, noué derrière la tête. Retourne la carte, c'est le pendu, c'est Villon. 
Je suis François dont il me poise, né de Paris en pré pontoise, et de la corde d'une toise sera mon col que mon cul poise. <rires> Three more brief little things to read, and uh, read Mer Mercury, the last poem in this book, um, but just in English, I'm afraid. Um, Mercury, when I broke the glass of thermometer, out ran the mercury in one liquid blob, matter calling to matter like not one of its molecules wanted to be parted from another, even for a moment. Mercury was supposed to be so mercurial, like Ariana Raines, the American poet, you know, Ariana Raines. The poet who, we were celebrating her book in Chicago, Mercury, it was called. Yeah, see how easy I can just slip into these? elements. <laughs> in Chicago for the AWP, she and Dodie and Peter and Louis Warsh reading together in a bar and Ariana canceled due to snow in New York. But the crowd learned that she had deputized Thurston Moore to read for her and so they were assuaged. But then it turned out Thurston had missed the same plane. Joel Craig, the MC, came out and had to announce they wouldn't be getting Ariana, nor Thurston, but me. <laughs> and this one woman sitting at a round table by herself, nearby the mic, by herself except for 14 bottles of beer surrounded her. <laughs> when she heard this news, she smashed a bottle on the table and screamed, fuck that, and be bolted out into the snow. So I got up to read, thinking, worst auspices ever. But then my mind ran clear, and I declared to myself, I would be Ariana for half an hour. Just assume her identity. To my aid came Vespas on silvery wings. Why, I was more Ariana than she herself had ever been. <laughs> I'm sure, and as I spoke her words, I understood. Did you ever have, have this happen to you where you're reading somebody else's work and you like, you feel it? like you? You feel like you're writing it yourself? I, as she, I spoke her words, I understood the difficult section of Mercury called Thursday, as has nobody else before or since. I was writing it on stage, live, giving it to my fans, word by word, and I realized that he, the missing Thurston, was the god they had coined the word Thursday after. <laughs> For he would bless us on a Thursday if we leaned on him. It could be any day of the week. It could be all the molecules in his body entering and filling mine. I would be a day I'd run around after myself. I would cohere. When I finished, the silence swelled around me, profound, then a burst of sustained applause. And even the woman out in the snow was sobbing, for she hadn't heard me. <laughs> I'll read this one more piece by Jack Spicer, and this was a, a letter, I'm do, editing Spicer's letters, and this one recently came to light just this summer, and it was so beautiful, I, like, I want to share it with you. Um, one of his students was a Chinese-American, very young artist at the San Francisco Art Institute, who graduated, but she still kept in touch with him, and she was 
feeling down about everything. Her career wasn't going well. There was like, there was prejudice against Chinese artists and women artists at the time that she couldn't surmount. And she was unhappy in love. Dear Joanne, this is April 20th, 1955. I know just what you mean. I feel it myself, of course, in the bars and the school and the other places I live, more now than I did a few years ago. The answer, he was 30 when he wrote this, the answer, and a poor one, is this, I think. You can only communicate with another human being by a miracle, and you have to wait patiently for miracles and believe in them a little, too. Nonsense helps, but it has to be the right kind of nonsense. Strength of belief helps even more. It has to be the right kind that doesn't curdle up inside you and become dreams. And magic helps the most, but it has to be the right kind of magic that is not ventriloquism. The voices cannot be your own. Everything that isn't a miracle is unimportant. And that includes the ego, the libido, and the atomic bomb. These were like big ideas in mid-50s mid in California. But you will say, three o'clock in the morning come, come so very often. It lasts so long in the night and tugs at the edge of you for so much of the day. That's true, and nothing one can do about it. A miracle doesn't destroy the clock. It merely stops it. So, brethren, there abideth these three, despair, diversion, and miracle. But the greatest of these is miracle, love, Jack. Hi, pretty. And I'll read my last poem. And it's from my book, Tony Green Era. It's called my, my Coloring Book. I had to give a workshop, and the kids had to, uh, the students had to color in coloring books. Do you have them here in France? <laughs> you do with crayons? <laughs> I was coloring in this picture, thinking of how I always like to stay between the lines. But then I, I was distrusting my memory of like myself as a child. Did I ever really like to stay between the lines? Did I like it especially? Or was it that I always wanted the gold star certain teachers would award me? Pictures of geese, oh, easy to color. <laughs> Pictures of rabbits in complicated house dresses, no thanks. <laughs> Early on, boy learns the easy way out. I was coloring in the picture and the crayons seemed unresponsive to the facts of a goose, the facts of the boy. Mm. There's Santa. What color is Santa? Kind of red, but not the red in the box. And his face was red. I sat on his lap, saw the sheer Irish weight of scotch on his cheeks. <laughs> so in despair, I stood and tried picking up the other little kid's crayons slipping them into my pockets, turning to crime, I guess. But there, on teacher's desk, a packet of stars, gleaming gold like the mirrors of Shanghai. And a little voice screamed in my brain, take them, <laughs> take the stars, take back the materials of specialized labor. <laughs> take the applause. Why make the thing when you can't take the reward? <laughs> it was done in a minute, and I embarked on a colorful career. <laughs> Thank you.